prophets have spoken of him from the beginning of time. He is the Alpha and Omega, the first and the last. He is our high priest, the Lion of Judah, the child born in a manger, the coming King. He is Emmanuel. Well, good morning, church family, and Merry Christmas this season. Uh, We have the awesome privilege this morning of taking the Lord's Supper together. And so if you did not get the elements on your way in, if you would lift your hand, we have deacons who are ready to pop up and to make sure that you have those, just lift your hand high. Uh, If you are a born again believer, then you are invited, you are welcome to take the Lord's Supper with us this morning. This This is for all of us who have been saved by the blood of Jesus Christ. And so, beloved, <clears throat> the entire service, right, is, is going to be moving towards the moment when we take the Lord's Supper and, and we never want to do that in an unworthy manner. So just be preparing your heart and asking the Lord to examine you. I would be remiss if I didn't take the opportunity to just uh, say what an incredible job Mark and the worship choir did for us last week. <clears throat> the, the amount of effort, they have to start Christmas in the summer uh, when it's hot and sweaty around here, uh, but it was, it was incredible and uh, what a joy and privilege Uh, that that was and continues to be. Turn with me in your Bibles to Revelation chapter 5. Revelation chapter 5. As we're continuing our Christmas series where we are going to look in the book of Revelation and see the different pictures, uh, revelations of Christ that are in the book. Think with me in your mind that shepherds are in the fields of Bethlehem, raising flocks of lambs, leading them to pasture and water, protecting them from uh, predators. Most of them there in Bethlehem will, will be for slaughter in the temple that is just 25 miles north in Jerusalem. They need daily sacrifices, especially during the Passover an unblemished male of one year old. Historian Josephus estimated that as many as 265,000 lambs would be sacrificed in the temple during Passover. So in Revelation chapter five, our second glorious picture of Jesus in the Revelation is of a lamb slain. A lamb slain. Remember, the purpose of the book is to give us pictures, to reveal and to detail for us who God is. God is adamant throughout the Bible that you are not to make an image of him because he is going to reveal to us himself and give us that picture. And so this morning, as we pray... I want you to contemplate the lamb slain and the significance, beloved, that our God is not only a God who is near, but he is a God who is near and enters in even in our sin. He does not shrink back. Will you pray with me? Our Heavenly Father, as we open your word, as we think through the description of of you revealing your Son to us so that we might comprehend and see you, Father, I pray anyone under the sound of my voice that does not know you as Lord and Savior God, that you would stir faith, 
that you would allow them to see the magnificence and the beauty of, of who you are. And those of us that, that are saved, that do know you, God, that you would stir our hearts afresh, that we would be captivated by your magnificence, that you are a God who enters in even while we are sinful. You do not shrink back. You do not turn your face, but you press in towards our sin and you solve it, sending your son a lamb slain. It is in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. I'm going to begin in Revelation chapter 4. Revelation chapter 4 functions as the backdrop of a play that leads to the action that occurs in Revelation chapter 5. The lights dim. And the audience hushes to a silence because the play is about to start. As the curtains are drawn, the spectators take in the setting, the colors, the smells, the sounds. Where are we? What time period? What action is about to take place? In Revelation chapter 4, John has been transported from Patmos to a new scene. He is in the heavens. As his eyes focus, it's the most magnificent sight that he has ever beheld. He is in the throne room of heaven, God's throne. Now, pause to think about this because it's always exciting to go to a higher up official's office, right? To the mayor's office or or to the governor in Austin. We take vacations and trips and tour the White House and take selfies while we're inside. The higher up you go, the more exciting. You see, there are thrones above thrones above thrones until there is only one. The Lord God Almighty. John's eyes drink in all that they can, but his brain cannot keep up. Words fail. Never have words seemed so inadequate. He is indescribable. His majesty and glory fill everything. God himself cannot be described. And so John begins with the glory that is emanating from his presence. That aura of light surrounding. And and John compares the most precious and beautiful stones the world has ever seen. An array of different colors like Stones refracting the light, jasper and sardis with glitter and shine, greens and whites and reds like a rainbow around the throne. Now, if you've never seen anything like the crown jewels of England refracting magnificent sparkle, then think of the most beautiful sunset with the sky afire with an array of colors. How do you describe a God who is more beautiful and magnificent than 10,000 sunsets? More white and pure than the driven snow, more brilliant than the noonday sun, whose knowledge is so immense, he knows every thought in every library. How do you describe a God whose love is more faithful, self-giving, and caring than the ideal mother? Who just knowing him is more nurturing than the best foods? Who is more powerful than all the unleashed forces of nature? Psalm 104 says, you are clothed with splendor and majesty. He wraps himself in light as with a garment. You see, in the end, there is no describing God. Just the glory 
around him. John moves on from the throne and begins to describe those that surround the throne. In verse 4 of chapter 4, there are 24 elders who are probably an extremely high form of angelic beings. Now, regardless of their identity, their function is to praise God day and night along with the four living creatures. Now, imagine you showed up to my house on a Saturday morning unannounced. You would get me in my pajamas and probably be invited in for breakfast. Now, this is just hypothetical, so don't show up, all right? <laughs> now, imagine you showed up at the White House unannounced. Would you get President Biden in his pajamas? Would you be invited in for breakfast? No. Why not? Well, first, you wouldn't even get to the door because of gates and securities and metal detectors. And on top of that, he's got people. Okay? He's surrounded by functionaries and administrators and servants. Okay? You don't get immediate access because he's very important. I am not. So what about God? See, that's the point when you read Revelation chapter 4 that you see layers upon layers of principalities that are spectacular. And in chapter 5, that number grows to 10,000 times 10,000 angels that are singing all in a choir, all of that enhancing the authority of the throne. And John is removed from the scene at a distance as he describes God's holiness that permeates and also separates God on his throne. Verse 5, out of the throne come flashes of lightning and sounds and peals of thunder. There are parts of the world that experience earthquakes and hurricanes and tsunamis. Around here, we experience tornadoes and awesome thunderstorms. As a kid, I remember counting the seconds between seeing the lightning and hearing the thunder to be able to calculate how close it was. In fact, one evening as a child, our chimney was struck by lightning and we were in the living room there's a skylight right there as lightning struck. I've never seen anything that bright, that powerful, that just horrifying in an instant. There's nothing like the power of nature unleashed, okay, full of it on display. And here, out of the throne come flashes of lightning and thunder. You will recall in Exodus 19 when God descended on Mount Sinai and was giving the covenant to Israel and to Moses that the people were scared out of their minds. They saw fire come down and flashes of lightning and peals of thunder and they said, Moses, you go up, we're going that way, okay? They did not want any part Additionally, there is a sea of glass that is divorcing John from the rest of the scene. And the sea represents the fallen order that now separates John from the holy throne of God. He doesn't just wander into the throne room and casually say, I'm here, God. God is holy, separate. He is self-sufficient. He doesn't need us. He's not dependent upon us. He is personal because it is his chosen course to be personal. Not because he was lonely and needed anything. He sustains the universe by his own thoughts. Finally, the scene of the throne room in chapter 4 highlights God's character that is on display. 
In verses six through eight, there are four living creatures that center and are around the throne. Now, let me explain that imagery for you really quick because that causes lots of confusion. But think with me about an ancient imperial throne. And you know how, like even in this picture, you see how there's a head of a lion that's coming out? If you were going to sit on a throne, all right, why would a king choose to put the head of a lion that's coming out that's ferocious and just in this magnificent mane? Why would you sit on a throne and want that coming out? Well, because it projects power and strength. Right? You sit on a throne, you are declaring, this is the kind of character that I have. Well, that's what's going on here with the four living creatures. They signify the characteristics of the one who sits on the throne. Authority and strength, intelligence and watchful care. The fact that the four living creatures have six wings calls our minds to the seraphim out of uh, Isaiah chapter 6 who uh, with two wings covered their feet and with two wings covered their eyes and with two wings they flew and they did not cease to cry out day or night, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty and the earth is full of his glory who was and is and is to come. You see, there is no one like him. He is indescribable. He is mighty and he radiates glory. He is worthy of servants upon servants of untold worship. And John's place is clear in light of God's holiness that he is far removed and distant from such glory. And now the scene is set. And listen to chapter 5, verses 1 and 2. And I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne a scroll written inside and on the back and sealed up with seven seals. And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the scroll and to break its seals? The action has begun. And the spotlight focuses in for us on a scroll, a scroll of unparalleled significance in the right hand of God Almighty. The destiny of the world depends upon the scroll. You see, the world is full of chaos and hurt and violence. It's full of sin and hate and the enemies who rebel against God. And those who love God are persecuted, maligned, even killed. Is God going to allow this to continue? For sin to continue to destroy and cause chaos and ruin? The scroll that is in God's right hand is his plan for redemption for the rest of human history. God's judgment upon his enemies against sin and rebellion. The scroll also tells about God's protection and provision for his own who are being persecuted. And when the scroll ends, it ends with the day of the Lord making everything right. The new heavens and the new earth, paradise restored, a place where sin is no more and everything has been made new. No tears or hurt or chaos. And God with his people. But that plan of redemption has been sealed within the scroll. And unless it is opened like a will, it will not be enacted. And so a massive angel booms. 
is there anyone worthy to break the seals and to open the scroll? A great voice is needed because the call is sent to the far reaches of all of creation. The scope is parallel with the enormity of the task. Is there anyone throughout all of history, on earth, or even in the heavens, angels, seraphim, any other magnificent beings who is worthy to open the scroll of destiny? The terms are set such that God himself will not perform the task, but he calls for a mediator. But who might be strong enough, wise enough, pure enough, in order to enact the redemption of fallen universe, to undo all the wrong that has been done? And no one in heaven or on the earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or to look into it. And I began to weep, that's John, greatly because no one was found worthy to open the scroll or to look into it. The silence reverberated unending. John held his breath, hoping for the announcement of one, just one. But there is no reply. None, anyone, is worthy. And John loses control of his emotions. He says, this can't be. The universe can't be stuck with the lovers of God persecuted and enemies of God reigning and those who do evil wagging their finger at God. We can't be stuck in this state of fallenness without hope. Nothing but darkness into the future. And John weeps. Stop weeping. Behold, The lion that is from the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has overcome so as to open the scroll and its seven seals. Yes, yes. It is as if the angel comes and wraps his arm around John and says, stop weeping. Lift your head. Look. The promised king from the tribe of Judah. Genesis 49, 9 and 10. The promised one from the line of David. Isaiah 11, 1. He has overcome. And he will break its seals. And he will open the scroll. And unfold and enact the redemption of the rest of history. And verse 6 tells us. That he is coming from within the throne. Oh, I hope you see the significance. Right? Only God could. The entire universe was searched and none but God. Out of the throne comes Jesus the lion from the tribe of Judah and his royalty and dignified and ruling and all-powerful. And John turns to look, anticipating to see the powerful reigning lion. And instead he sees a lamb slain. A frail, peaceful, innocent animal of prey. A lamb slain in sacrifice. And scripture calls to mind Abraham on the top of the mountain about to sacrifice Isaac when when the angel 
signals stop and points to a male lamb caught in a nearby thorn bush. Or daily sacrifices, both morning and evening, required at the temple, a lamb slain and his blood poured out on the altar for sins. Or at Passover, how every family took an unblemished one-year-old male lamb and ate it and put the blood over the doorpost. Isaiah 53, verse 7, like a lamb that is led to the slaughter and like sheep that is silent before its shears, so he did not open his mouth. Quiet, submissive, humble, a lamb slain in sacrifice. What an image for the savior of the world. The only one worthy to redeem creation. Who is strong enough and wise enough and pure enough. Jesus, the lamb who was slain, who conquered through crucifixion. Victory through sacrifice. Listen to Isaiah 53 that was written 700 years before the coming of Christ. He was despised and abandoned by men. A man of sorrows and familiar with sickness. And like one from whom people hide their faces, he was despised. And we had no regard for him. However, it was our sickness that he himself bore and our pains that he carried. Yet we ourselves assumed that he had been afflicted, struck down by God and humiliated. But he was pierced for our offenses. He was crushed for our wrongdoings. The punishment of our well-being was laid upon him. By his wounds, we are healed. All of us, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way. But the Lord has caused the iniquity of us all to fall on him. Turn with me in this moment and prepare the bread, beloved. As you take it and hold it, we will take this bread together. The passage that I've just read, that he has bore our sickness in his body. For our sins, he was pierced. I'm going to give you just a few moments. Let me implore you. Confess your sins to a God who presses near to them and looks straight at them. He says, confess them. Bow before him. Remember with earnestness the sacrifice that he has done on your behalf. And after taking some bread and breaking it, he declared to his disciples, this is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Now as you prepare the cup, 
so that we might take it together. Isaiah 53, of as magnificent as that entire passage is, and it's hard to even say what, what is the most magnificent, but verse 10 of Isaiah 53 says this. After, after the description of the lamb who was silent, who was crushed, who was pierced for our iniquities, verse 10 says, but the Lord was pleased to crush him. My goodness. But the Lord was pleased to crush him, putting him to grief. If he would render himself as a guilt offering, that he would see his offspring, that he would prolong his days, and the good pleasure of the Lord will prosper in his hand. In other words, there is a reward on the other side. The father was pleased to crush the son so that you and I this morning could stand in victory of the forgiveness of the son of God, the lamb that was slain. So as we take this together, we drink the cup of victory and we shout hallelujah to the Lamb. Real quickly, let me finish the passage in Revelation chapter 5, verse 6. After saying, I saw in the middle of the throne, right, a Lamb standing as if slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. See, the lamb is standing because he is resurrected. He's resurrected. Now, you've heard me say with apocalyptic literature, do not draw a seven-horned, seven-eyed lamb because it's disgusting. It's awful looking. Don't do that. The horns and the eyes, they indicate that he has all power and all wisdom. And the eyes are further defined as the lamb that sends out the Holy Spirit into all the earth. And then the lamb takes the scroll out of the hand of him who sits on the throne. All right? Who is worthy to walk up and to grab the scroll? The lamb then takes the scroll. And when he does... All of creation, that entire scene just explodes in praise. And they begin to sing a new song. Worthy are you to open the scroll. For you were slain and you pur purchased with your blood people from every tribe and tongue and nation. And the scene unfolds and you get myriads and myriads of angels that erupt in praise, all of them singing, worthy is the lamb. It's a scene, guys, that forces you to examine the affections of your own heart, to realize that those who can see clearly, those that have the perspective that is unlike ours, they delight to worship the lamb. They delight. It is what they long to do. It is not forced. It is not coerced. It is their delight to worship the lamb. It is the night of the first Christmas. A small group of shepherds are lying in the fields of Bethlehem. They have tended their sheep and now they rest for the evening. It was an outcast job, gypsies, to travel around with herds. They are poor, smelly. They cannot read or write. They are completely disregarded in society, except for the fact that they provide the sheep that are needed for sacrifices in the temple in nearby Jerusalem. 
lambs that are raised for slaughter. They need protection of the shepherd to fend off predators and their guidance to lead them to food and water and their care to nurse their wounds. This small group of shepherds, unnoticed by the world, are the only ones invited by special invitation from angels to come behold the Lamb of God lying in a manger wrapped in rags born amongst the animals because there was no room elsewhere amongst the people. Remember the heavenly heights that we have seen. Myriads of angels crying, worthy is the Lamb. And now the humble depths that he has plunged. Worthy is the Lamb. From exaltation to humiliation. From the throne to a manger, from dignity to debasement, from worship to the wrath to come. He has come for you, dear one, so that his blood might redeem you unto himself so that you might see his grace and his kindness and cry out on your own, worthy is the lamb. Would you pray with me? King Jesus, we bow before you right now in our hearts and in our minds with our whole beings, God, and we cry, worthy are you. There is no God like you who not only enters into our suffering and into our plight, you enter into our sin and you provide the sacrifice and the escape. You look directly at our sin. You do not shrink back, but instead you come in our stead. And worthy are you to save us through sacrifice. Your victory, victory through laying down your life. Heavenly Father, if there is one person under the sound of my voice that does not know you as their Lord and Savior, I pray right now in Jesus' name, God, that you would open their eyes and give them faith that they would cry out, save me, King Jesus, that they would look upon the Lamb and that they would have delight in their heart as they turn from their sin, as they see the magnificent picture of who you are as a God. God, there is no one like you. We worship you. We declare you are worthy. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.